Please stand with me. As you know, it's our custom to rise for the reading of the gospel. It's a very, very short gospel today. We rise, of course, because these are the words of the Lord directly given. It's a custom, not a commandment. But it helps us remember that when the Lord speaks, it's wise for us to listen. And as David reminded us these last weeks, we've been in Matthew chapter 10, in which, we've, which Jesus told all of his disciples coming back from a mission about what the kingdom was like, the kind of suffering like himself they would have to endure, the cross they would have to pick up. And then he comes to this, in some ways, enigmatic teaching, verses 40 through 42, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. I would hesitate to come into the Lord's presence without inviting him, so please, if you will, pray with me. Father in heaven, we are or we ought to be delighted to be in your presence. You made your promise through your Son that when even two or three gather in his name, you come. And so indeed we come into your throne room today, Father. Because of Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit you sent to all of us who are his followers and his disciples and his subjects. So we pray today, teach us by your Spirit. Pour out that Spirit in fullness that we leave today knowing we have met with you. Since Easter here at Christ Church, I think you, all of you, heavens, you've all been here and we hope many of you others have as well. We've done this on-again, off-again series about the kingdom of God. Sometimes Jesus calls it the kingdom of heaven. It's one of the most recurrent themes in all of his teaching. We'll conclude, conclude that series today, at least for now. But you may not know that it was only 50 years ago or so that the kingdom of God, the theme of the kingdom of God, was rediscovered by preachers after a long time of being neglected. One of my mentors, <clears throat> a man named David Maines, a pastor and preacher, in teaching about the kingdom of God, attempted to put it in words that could help moderns like us. He put it this way, the kingdom of God is anywhere that Jesus is acknowledged as Lord, as King, where his will is obeyed, and where obedient subjects enjoy the benefits of his righteous rule. The kingdom of heaven is anywhere Jesus is acknowledged as king, where his subjects are obedient to him, where his will is obeyed, and where obedient subjects enjoy the benefits of his righteous reign. I still find that formula helpful. And interestingly, today's three readings help us best understand these three aspects of the kingdom. As we go through them today, I hope they can anchor our hearts in our identity as being part of that kingdom. We'll take them in turn. First, what it means to give Jesus our allegiance as our sovereign. And secondly, what it means, and to a degree how we become obedient servants, and thirdly, what are indeed the benefits of his reign? If I were put, to put it all into a single sentence, I'll expect you to memorize this. We'll test you at the end. Obedient subjects of Jesus are given the power to live like him 
and therefore will live with him from now into eternity. Obedient subjects of Jesus are given the power to live like him, and so, therefore, will live with him from now until eternity. So first, what does it mean to be the subject of a monarch, a king, or a queen? As you know, monarchies are few and far between these days, often embattled and and usually embedded in democracies. And I don't know about you, but for an individualistic modern like me, I struggle to grasp with what it means to be truly a subject, a citizen under the authority of a king whose will with whom I have no ultimate right to disagree. I'd like to read what was or is today's psalm. It's from Psalm 89. It's a royal psalm. It's a, it's a tribute to the King of Heaven. I'm reading from an old psalter in modern language. I'd like you to listen. You're welcome to read along, but, but tune your heart to these words. Psalm 89. My song shall be always of the loving kindness of the Lord. With my mouth will I ever be proclaiming your faithfulness from one generation to another. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness shall be established in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one, says the Lord. I have sworn to David my servant, your seed will I establish forever and set up your throne from one generation to another. O Lord, the heavens will praise your wondrous works and your faithfulness in the assembly of the saints. For who in the clouds can be compared unto the Lord? And who among the gods is like unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the council of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those who are round about him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you? Your faithfulness, most mighty Lord, is round about you. You rule the raging of the sea. You still the waves when they arise. You've subdued Rahab of the deep and destroyed her. You've scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. You laid the foundation of the world and all that is in it. You've made the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, and high as your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your face. Blessed are the people, O Lord, who rejoice in you. They shall walk in the light of your countenance. Their delight shall be in your name all the day long. And in your righteousness shall they make their boast. For you are the glory of their strength. And by your favor you shall lift up our might. For the Lord is our defense. The Holy One of Israel is our King. These are words of someone who in older language would be described as awestruck. In God's kingdom, one understands his power, his goodness, and his transcendence. In short, and in words that grate upon a modern heart, we come to know our place, our limitations before him. That's how we hold someone in awe. It's a word much abused, but in its original definition, it goes like this. Awe is a feeling of respect or reverence mixed with dread and wonder, often inspired by something majestic or powerful. How do we, awestruck only by technology and having reduced awesomeness to something that is merely our preference, how do we understand how to hold the Lord of glory in awe? We're actually discouraged from doing so by the world around us. David highlighted last week the message around us that we hear is that God's purpose for existence is merely to serve us, to be our friend, 
and our comfort. And indeed, we do have a friend in Jesus. But he's not just there to get us out of a tight spot. And often, because we've come to view him that way, we have stripped him of his power. And so, he's neither high nor holy because those have become irrelevant terms in our society at least. So how do we see him like the psalmist did? I don't know if this will help you, but um, an experience of my youth, in the first year I went to university, a Christian university in which chapel was required every day, 2,000 of us would gather to sing and listen to a sermon and pray a bit. Um, the president emeritus of our seminary was a famous, famous missionary and lecturer and had been president and, and had retired. And he came usually to preach um, once every quarter to the student body. His name was V. Raymond Edmund. And on this particular um, chapel day, his theme, his chosen theme, was in the presence of the Lord. And in order to draw us into the Lord's presence, he told us the story from his own life. When he had been allowed to visit the last emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, he took great pains to describe what it took to step into the presence of the emperor, the presence of the king. He said, I arrived at the palace and came into an antechamber, and I was instructed to go to a lavatory dressing room on the side to take off my clothes and my shoes and to wash, to put on the robes of the court and the shoes of the court. Then he said, I was taken to stand before two tall 20-foot doors, black as onyx, with bright gold handles, and a chamberlain at each door. He said, in my name was announced at court, and those great black doors swung open. He said, and I looked down at the longest red carpet I'd ever seen in my life. And there at the end, high up on the dais, in a throne, was a small little man, Haile Selassie. But he said, you know, as I progressed down that aisle, and he was sharing this with us, my sense of awe and wonder at his power and at the reverence in which he was held grew and grew. And it reminded me of what it meant to be in the presence of the Lord. That's how one treats a king who is worthy of his throne, and that is what it means to acknowledge Jesus as king. That said, and to be honest, awe has never actually worked very well to inspire human obedience, has it? Not for the children of Israel, not for countless generations of Gentiles. We've all proven that. I mean, if you need any real proof, just look around at how we respond to COVID regulations. You know, it's not easy for us to be obedient. And so we'll move to this second point, that a subject who holds his king in awe is obedient to his king. We have two texts today, one from Jeremiah and the other from Romans. And both of them help us understand obedience from both sides of the coin. Jeremiah 28, that what we heard was just a snippet of a, uh, the climax really, of a prophetic argument between Jeremiah and a prophet in the court of King Zedekiah, Israel's last monarch before they were taken into captivity and Jerusalem was finally destroyed. It's a very human story of how we humans find our way to disobedience. How we humans find our way to disobedience. But it really begins a little before what we heard read. So if you will, you want to turn with me. I think it will be page... Lost it. Sorry. 27. Chapter 27 of Jeremiah. Verse 5. Jeremiah is telling the emissaries to the court of the king and the king himself, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, to all the kings around Israel and to Israel's king, 
I've made the earth, the man, and the beast that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I've given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I've given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field I've also given him to serve. So all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until their time has come. Okay, it's only then when we understand what the Lord had said through Jeremiah to King Zedekiah that what we read from chapter 28 starts to make sense. You'll recall because you just heard it, verses 1 to 4, Jeremiah gives us account of this time in court when King Zedekiah is approached by in Hebrew Hananiah, or Hananiah we say, and Hananiah declared to the king that everything was going to be all right in just two years. The Babylonian siege of Jerusalem would fade away and everyone would come back. Zedekiah was the last of the Davidic line. He was a vassal because he had already been, his, his uh, father had already, his, no, his nephew had already been defeated by the king, king Nebuchadnezzar. He was now ruling under the authority of Nebuchadnezzar, and he, he had revolted by trying to set up alliances with surrounding nations and failed. And now Nebuchadnezzar, who had carried off all the gold and most of the best and brightest of Israel into captivity in Babylon, was back to finish the job. And as we heard, Jeremiah told Zedekiah that he would serve the Babylonians in chapter 5. Earlier, Jeremiah had relayed the reason why in chapter 2. Israel is full of things from the east, he said. Fortune tellers like the Philistines. The land is so filled with silver and gold. There are treasures everywhere and their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their own hands. Kind of sounds familiar. Then he adds, the lofty pride of men shall be humbled. But Hananiah, the king's prophet, knew what Zedekiah wanted to hear. And so he says, in just two years, the exiles will return, the gold will be back, everything will be fine. And Jeremiah, the curmudgeon that he is, says, amen. I can only wonder if it was sarcastic or ironic or if he just played it straight. May the Lord do so, he says, and goes on as we read. Well, of course, the Lord hadn't changed his mind. And so Jeremiah adds this footnote that we heard. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when that word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Or restated simply, be sure the Lord will find you out. Hananiah chose disobedience. He preferred the approval of the king he could see rather than the master of the universe. It's not a problem unknown to us. The seduction of agreeing for the sake of approval. But the next day, the Lord called his game. He gave Jeremiah a message to Hananiah. Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have uttered rebellion against the Lord. And then Jeremiah adds a little footnote, a denouement, and says, In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. Awe-inspiring, isn't it? However, there's an alternative way laid out for us in Romans, and there's much more in Romans 6 than we can talk about today, but it makes something really clear. 
This is page 1057 in your, in your New Testaments, Romans 6, starting at about the 12th verse. We have to go quickly through it, though. It points out very clearly that what we call sin is simply rejecting the Lord, his sovereignty, and choosing our own. That that's where all sins originate. Believers in Jesus have a choice to make, and it goes like this. Verse 13. Do not present your members, that is, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God, to righteousness, as being alive from the dead, instruments of righteousness to God. Okay, when one presents oneself at court, one is acknowledging the fact that you stand before the king to whom you give your allegiance. So the apostle is saying, you've got a choice. You present yourself to your own will, or you present yourself to the Lord of heaven, and by so doing, you're choosing whom you will serve. Simple, right? Yeah, not so easy. Um, The Apostle Paul tries to make it easier for us to understand in verse 17. Let Let me read it to you. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Got it? Really, Pauline, if we want to understand that, however, we have to jump back to chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, famous, famous line, we have peace with God. We've been reconciled to him through our Lord Jesus the Messiah, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That is, we stand, we're firm. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, echoes of Matthew 10, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. You feel the change that's happening? Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God, that is, hope won't fail us, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to whom? To us. The obedience from the heart that made it possible for any of us to trust Jesus to forgive our rebellion and reunite us with God also brought to us, into us, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the great life-changing power on this earth that is still fallen. Confronted with a choice to sin or not, to rebel or to obey, a subject of the king must only ask for help and then, trusting in that help, press forward trying to do the right thing. Or in the words of that Baptist mystic, Oswald Chambers, at the beginning, we do not reconcile ourselves to the fact of sin. We take a rational view of life and say that a man or a woman, by controlling his or her instincts and by educating themselves, can produce a life which will slowly evolve into the life of God. Don't we have evidence of that all around us? But we find sin upsets all our calculations. We have to recognize that sin is a fact. It is a red-handed mutiny against God. Either God or sin must die in my life. And the Apostle Paul chimes in. If God rules in me, sin will be killed. That is the sanctifying, holy-making promise of the Spirit. And it's how we are able to obey the King. Uh, Did that help? Let me go one step further into how it works for me. I'm a type A personality. I rush around doing things because doing things make me feel good. When I see someone who's hurting or struggling and I'm on my way to an appointment, what I want to do is simply walk by. 
If I want to sit and stop and help and pray, I have to say, Holy Spirit, you've got to change my heart. And I find if I even try to obey and stop, the help comes. Even more, if I'm working on a task with somebody who lets me down, inside my judgment starts to rise like bile. And if I don't say, Lord, help me, give me the grace to give this person That's the grace I would like given to myself when I make a mistake. And then you know what? Suddenly, that grace comes, and I can give it. I don't know if that helps, but that's what works for me. And I can say, given the chance, he's faithful. We can become obedient. We can become like him. Don't believe all the people who say we're simply broken. Yes, we're broken. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can obey and we can become holy. And I'll tell you, it is quietly glorious. Last week, David reminded us from Matthew that the kingdom requires sacrifice, right? Taking up the cross as Jesus took up his, and so it is. And probably taking up the cross represents the height of obedience. But as he said earlier, and as I want to say clearly again, uh, Jesus is also clear about there being a reward. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 10, you can follow along. I forget what page it is. Hopefully you can find it. Chapter 10, verse 40. And I want you to note, he says, "He he who receives you receives me, And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. Okay, Jesus wasn't yet resurrected to his throne in heaven, but the word receive should give us a clue. He's restating this formula of the kingdom. A monarch receives someone and gives him recognition. So he's saying, someone receives you because your spirits, my spirits within you, they receive me. If they receive me, they receive my Father in heaven because we are all one. And then he goes on to list these rewards. And you know, for someone like me who has of this last decade gotten really excited about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, I thought, boy, what's a prophet's reward? What's a righteous person's reward? There must be some secret key somewhere in the Old Testament or in the, or in the rabbi's teaching. But you know what? I think it's much simpler than that. I think it's simply Jesus is illustrating the nature of the kingdom of God and the fact that he's not a respecter of persons. A prophet like Jeremiah suffers, is honored, but you know it's a big job, isn't it? And a person who's declared to be righteous gets a lot of praise. It's really important in the kingdom of God, isn't it? But you know, someone like you and me who gives a cup of cold water to another disciple of Jesus or to a child, who stops to look, to help, to give, You know what Jesus is saying? That kind of obedient servant in my kingdom will not go without reward. And in Romans, Paul makes it very clear the reward for that kind of living is life with Jesus now, beginning in eternity, that lasts into the ages and ages and ages to come. There will be some skeptics who will say, well, isn't expecting a reward, being selfish. I think it depends upon the reward. If you save your money and invest it wisely and buy the right kind of property, what are you expecting? Financial security. If you exercise in a diligent way and eat the right kind of food, the reward you expect is good health and maybe a little bit longer life. But it doesn't always work. But you know what? It's not like that in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, when you stop to show mercy to someone, are you short of a reward? When you intercede for someone instead of gossiping about them, is there a reward? You betcha. And that's not even the big one. The kingdom of God awards obedient service servants, rewards that will last and last 
and last. And that's how Jesus can be acknowledged as king, his will can be obeyed, and as obedient subjects, we can enjoy the benefits of his reign. But there's a question you have to ask. Do you want to be a subject of the king or not? It's not a light question. Jesus teaches about the kingdom again and again and again. And if Christ Church in Jerusalem wants to be a beacon of light of the kingdom of God here in this present darkness, or you, wherever you are, expect to be a beacon of light with the community around you, you have to make the choice to step into the kingdom. Not just believe, oh, you may make it in by the skin of your teeth to eternity, but if you want the richness of life with God, you pay the price and you receive the reward because you serve the king of glory. Really should close, I'm probably over time, but I don't want to without telling you the rest of that story that I began just a minute ago, oh well, a few minutes ago, about Dr. Edmund. So I didn't tell you the whole story. As he was walking down that, that aisle and talking to us about the greatness of the Lord he served, because Haile Selassie reminded him of what it was like and would be like that day when he stepped into the throne room of the kingdom of heaven and all the elders would be singing and there would be King Jesus and his father on the throne before him. And suddenly, he slumped over the pulpit and slid to the floor. And the chapel was drenched in silence. The provost stood up and he motioned us to leave quietly, and we did. The announcement came in the next hour of class that Dr. Edmund had gone home to the Lord. Now, I want you to rejoice here. He was a faithful, obedient servant, served in South America as a missionary, served as a pastor, served as a professor, finally, in the years of the war, assumed responsibility for a Christian college that was struggling and rebuilt it by the grace of God. And now he stood, sharing about his king, in front of those he loved most, his colleagues and his students. And the Lord took him up. Now I ask you, is there a better reward? Could you ask for reward more than that? Except that, of course, he no longer saw by faith, he saw by sight. May it be so for you and me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.